going to be here in a few minutes, but uh, Gary and I go back, well, he, uh, let's just say he's, he's probably one of my longest serving friends and ministry partners. Uh, I won't give you the number of decades, but I will tell you it's at least three decades we go back, back to Bible college days. And we've really kept a good relationship since then. And Gary has partnered with me in doing a podcast every Friday, uh, which we talk, call Kingdom Talk. And you can catch it on YouTube. You can catch it on Facebook, uh, many profiles. And it's just an opportunity for us to sit down. And, and the, of, of the people that I associate with, Gary is one that when, when we talk, we just gel. Uh, he comes up with things that... Man, I, I've never even thought of, and vice versa. We, we kind of really work well together in that. And, and Gary really has a heart to share the, the kingdom growth with individuals and with people. He runs a, a mentoring service, kind of a coaching service, I guess is the way they call it. Uh, if you want to get some personal coaching and, and so forth, he's definitely one of the guys to talk to about that. It is kind of his profession right now to do uh, coaching with individuals. So if you want to go deeper in those things, yeah, definitely talk to him after the service. But uh, just want to welcome Gary. Come on up. Let's give him a, a big hand. He, he's, he's a good friend of myself and, and the church, and we just really appreciate him in so many ways. So I think it's been a while since you've actually spoke here. I think it's going back. So we will give it over to you and be blessed, my friend. Thank you very much. Appreciate you allowing me to talk in <laughs> this place. Uh, yeah, good to see you all again. God bless you all. How you all doing today? Yeah? Okay. Well, I, uh, I was walking my dog uh, the, I don't know, about two weeks ago. That's a, a godly thing to do, especially if you don't want them to damage your house. Um, but anyways, I was, I was walking him along, and the, uh, uh, the scripture that I had been reading the day before, uh, yeah, day, maybe two days earlier, was uh, from Psalm 96, 97, verse 6, and it said, the heavens are proclaiming your righteousness. We should actually look that up, not trust my memory here. And... Uh, and so, as I was walking it, uh, walking my dog, I, I, it was early in the morning, the sun was shining, and uh, the, the, there was a, a nice little clouds there, and I'm thinking, the heavens are proclaiming God's righteousness. What does that mean? Uh, it, you know, it's baffling to me. It's like, yes, it's all nice and beautiful, but what, what significance does that have towards us as righteousness? What does that have to do with, with us? And, and so, I looked up the word righteousness, and uh, it's, the Hebrew word is zedek. It's, that's a, a zadi, a dalet, and a kof. And they have this picture of the zadi is, is, a, is a pictorial uh, of a hunter or, or a fish hook or, or a tail. And then the, the dalet is the picture of a doorway. And the kof is the picture of the back of a, of a head or a sunrise or, or a setting sun with the sun shining out. And so righteousness is a picture of, let's say, a hunter with a, with a fishing hook, and he's going after his prey. He's actively, in, I'm going to pursue this thing. I'm going to get this. And as he's doing that, he comes into this doorway where it's, ah, I've reached the place that I need to be. He comes into that path, and now I'm in, I'm in this place called righteousness. And so the sun shining down on us is like God because Jesus is our righteousness. We don't stand in our own ability and in our own work. We stand in what he did. And he is the bright morning star. Revelation chapter 22 verse 16 says he is the bright morning star. And it's like the heavens are proclaiming your salvation, your righteousness does not come from what you do. I don't make the sun rise and I don't make the sun set. I don't make the clouds come into the sky, etc. You know what I'm saying? It's God who does this and God is saying from heaven using the sun, moon, and stars and the, and the clouds that I am the reason that you become righteous. It's what I do in your life, not what you do. And because of what he does in our lives, 
we then pursue after the fruit of righteousness. And so the heavens are proclaiming. In Psalm 96, Psalm 97, Psalm 98, uh, there's this constant theme of nature, of the creation of heavens, proclaiming that God is righteous, that he wants to, uh, or, or that they, they are looking to proclaim the glory of God. They're looking to proclaim his justice. They're looking to proclaim his righteousness. They're looking, there's this, this trumpet sound that is going out that says, hey, everybody, look up to Jesus. Look at God. Look at him. Because if you, if you do, then goodness is going to come into your life. Then justice is going to come into your life. And so, as, I was, as I've been contemplating the, the June, the month of June, with all the thunderstorms that we had and all the rain that we had here, uh, as I'm contemplating the, 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 the sun that is shining, as I'm contemplating those things, I keep hearing this, reson- this, this, this trumpet, this, this sound that says, I want your attention. I, I really, really want your attention. Jesus in, in uh, Philippians chapter 2, it says, Jesus did not consider equal, equality with God something to be grasped. You all familiar with that scripture? Yes? Show of hands. Yes? Okay, two of you. Yay! <laughs> all right. In, in Ephesians, or sorry, Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In another version, it says he did not consider equality with God uh, a robbery to be made equal or, or to give up his equality with God. Because Jesus is the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, is God, and by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth. In Colossians chapter 1, it says that. In, first, in the book of John chapter 1, it says that as well. And so, he, he came in, he did not consider the fact to become like you and me as a loss. Think about that for a minute. What is it about you and me that Jesus thought was so important that he would empty himself and give up his position, well, not his position, um, I'm looking for words here because I don't want to be be a heretic, but he, he emptied himself. The book of Acts says that Jesus didn't do anything except by the power of the Holy Spirit. He did not, he, he lowered himself, he became a man, he emptied himself completely. Tell me, what is so important? What would God value so highly that he would give up the, the position of, uh, of, of equality with God? Okay, think about Yahweh, Yod, He, Vav, uh, He, Yahavah, or, or Yahweh is, is the Hebrew word, way of saying it. Um, he is the one who, in the beginning, there was chaos and darkness, and it was absolute destruction. There was, the, there was a great, it called, the Proverbs chapter 8 calls it the circle of the deep. He drew a circle in the deep, and it was uh, absolute, just nothing good. Absolutely nothing good. This God came into it and said, let there be light. Let there be order. Let the chaos come to an end. And instantly, light was there. At least that's the way I read it. It could have taken a couple minutes or something. I don't know. But it, it, he said, let there be light. And there was light. He said, let the waters be separated from the upper and the lower. Let the, let the firmament come up. Let there be trees. Let there be animals. Let there be etc., etc., right? He created it. This God who by his word can simply call something into being. The Bible says that in heaven, the streets are paved with gold. It says that in heaven, the, the gates and the foundation of, of, his, of, his, uh, of his city, of his, of, you know, of his mansion, of, of, of everything that he has there is, is so spectacularly uh, beyond what we can think or imagine here. I mean, He's got a pearl for a gate. He's got streets of gold. He's got layers of emeralds and, and, and jewels that, that built up the foundation in, in, as it spoke, speaks of in Revelation. 
This God who has angels bowing down before him. There are four living creatures, uh, one with the face of a lion, one with the face of a man, one with the face of an ox, one with the face of an eagle. And they, they come around the throne of God and they go like this and they look over and they get a revelation of who, who he is. And they're so taken aback by it that they cry out day and night for all of eternity, holy, holy, holy. There is none like him. The, it, holiness not in, in the sense of, well, you're doing right and you're doing wrong and they're... It's like holiness is this unbelievable magnitude of no one can compare with you. You are absolutely beautiful. You are the, you're the epitome of glory. You're the epitome of power. You're the epitome of everything. And, and this is who Jesus was, is, not was. <laughs> he, is. he was, he is, and he is to come. And this Jesus said, it's worth it to be emptied of all that. So my question is, what is it in the mind and heart of God that says, what would be worth that much that he would empty himself? It's you. God, what what he's saying in that is your worth or your equal, your value is equivalent with God. It doesn't mean you are God. It doesn't mean that you are uh, suddenly um, this this unique supernatural being that is taking on divinity. It's not saying that at all. What he's saying is, I value, you're valuable enough that I would lay down my life for you. You're valuable enough that I would equate you equal with me. And that that makes your position, that makes who you are so astoundingly incredible. If you have that much value to God, why would he reject you when you come to him in prayer? If you have that much value before God, why, what, what, what is there? What is, the, what is in the world today that is big enough to stand between you and him? His love is, is, is roaring over you. His love is so encompassing. His love is so powerful that he's looking at you and going, I want to embrace you. I want to pick you up. I want to pull you into my hands. I want to, I want to build you up because I understand what you were made for. You see, the Bible says that Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. The image and likeness of God. I could, uh, um, the, when I consider the, the, uh, the heavens, the sun, when I, when I consider the moon, when I consider the stars, when I consider the, the magnitude of those, of those things, I don't have a jet pack that I can travel to the moon yet. Neither does Elon Musk, <laughs> although he's working on it. Um, I don't have the ability to step into the sun naturally. I'll get fried when I, like, so, so quickly as, as I try and go to the sun. And yet, God says that these things are reflecting his glory. Because of who he is, he makes everything congruent with who he is. So creation is a reflection of his character. So when we see the sun coming up and we see the sun going down, or the earth revolving around the sun, I love the way that we... We make these comments knowing that the sun is positioned where it is. But we see sunrise and sunset. We see seasons. And and they're they're constant. They are right the way God intended them. The the moon reflects the sun. It it, it is created in such a way that when, when the sun shines on it, it reflects what the sun does. We're the same way. We reflect the glory of God. We reflect His 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 light. And in Psalm 97, it says, righteousness is sown for the righteous, sorry, light is sown for the the righteous, and joy for the upright in heart. So everything that God has made is designed to to reflect who he is. And his character is, is, is defined by his seven spirits that are around his throne. So you have the spirit of the Lord, which is identity, We are made in God's image. You have wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, might, and the fear of the Lord. And these seven are are, are a description 
uh, or, or they reflect or they, they teach about the, the character and the, and the image of God. You're made in the image of God. You're made in the image of likeness of God. You were created after, as, as a spirit being with a soul and with a body, you were created like him. You were, you were creative by nature. You have the ability to communicate and have um, conversation with God. You have a natural ability to receive wisdom in your life and grow in wisdom. You're designed to have counsel where, where there's more than one voice coming into your life that is, that is congruent again or, or in right alignment with God. You're designed by God in his image to have the, uh, a, a skill set. Uh, to have knowledge so like a journeyman can train a, an apprentice because they know what they're doing. They have skill. They have knowledge. Um, God has his 24 elders around the throne, it says in Revelation chapter 4. It says that there are the, the, there's the counsel of God. In the, in the Psalms, it talks about that. Uh, God has all of these characteristics. His government the might of his government that establishes who he is. So when Jesus came on the earth, he demonstrated the government of God when he said to the disciples, after he multiplied the fishes and the loaves, he said, let's go over to the Gadarenes on the other side. Let's get in the boat and go, go over there. And the, the scripture indicates that the disciples weren't too crazy about that idea. And so Jesus commanded them to get into the boat. They get into the, the boat, ship, whatever it was, and, and Jesus is sleeping, and uh, they're, they're going over there, and the storm comes up, and the disciples are literally expecting to die. They, they say, Master, we are drowning, we're dying, we're, we're, going to, we're going to come to an end here. How come you're sleeping? Wake up. And Jesus wakes up, looks at them, doesn't even acknowledge them at first. He speaks to the atmosphere, he speaks to the waves, he speaks to the wind and says, peace be still, shalom. And instantly the waves calmed down, the, everything became fine. And he looked at his disciples and said, where is your faith? And they were more terrified of him than they were of, of, of the storm that they were about to die with because they understood and recognized who Jesus was. And here's the, here's the backstory. Jesus was headed over to the area of Caesarea, the Gadareans, where there was a demonic principality ruling over that area. The Romans had a whole bunch of pigs in there, and they were setting up their idolatry worship. And Jesus was coming as the king, as the authority, as the Lord, to establish light and the kingdom of light where there was currently darkness. The demonic realm was, was terrified of that, and the demonic realm wanted to prevent it, and so it brought a storm trying to kill them. Jesus, being who he is as the Son of God, he just simply spoke to it because he understood that his Father is the one with the might. And he simply allowed the Holy Spirit to flow through him, and at his word, there was peace and there was calm. As soon as they landed in the Gadarenes, there was this demoniac who, had, who said he had a legion, which means about 6,000 demons. He came running at Jesus saying, please don't torment me before the time. The demons recognized the kingship of Jesus. They recognized the lordship. That's a demonstration of the might of the kingdom of heaven. And then finally, there's the fear of the Lord, which is a revealing of who God is. So when the four living creatures come before the throne of God and they cry, holy, holy, they're getting a revelation. The fear of the Lord is coming on them and they're like, just completely undone because of the revelation of what God is doing in them. Well, the spirit of the Lord is, uh, the fear of the Lord is also meant to do the same in you, to reveal Christ in you. Colossians says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So uh, your, your talent, your, uh, your business acumen, your education, your everything about you as, as an entire human being, the fear of the Lord is designed to reveal that because you are made in the image of God to walk in excellence. You're, made, you're designed to prosper and succeed in what you do. So that doesn't mean that life is a lottery, <laughs> you know, where I've won a million dollars or $10 million or whatever, whatever those big, big Powerball is and everything is just going to be easy. Quite the opposite. 
When the Bible talks about prosperity, when the Bible talks about uh, overcoming and living in success, it means hitting challenges and overcoming them. It means learning through them and growing up. So uh, King Solomon, it took him 40 years with the wisdom of God and the understanding of God to grow to the place where he was a multi-billionaire, even trillionaire. He didn't do that just like that. And there's this, sometimes there's this, there's this idea in Christianity that says, if I just pray, if I just say a word, then poof, everything is just going to be okay and everything's just going to be perfect. It doesn't work that way. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a seed that is planted. Seeds take time to grow. They, and, and so it's got to come to maturity. So I say all of that as a, as a backdrop for Psalm 96, uh, verses 4 to 6. Is that... I'll just read it here, unless it's coming up here. For great is the Lord, Yahweh. Anytime you see L-O-R-D in capital letters, that's a recognition that it's uh, Yahweh. And greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to Yahweh, O peoples of the, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Right there, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. The, the verses before that talk about the heavens worshiping God. It talks about the earth crying out and giving glory. And that's why I gave a little bit of that backdrop of walking with my dog and yay, Jesus, and, and having, having some, uh, this, this picture of, of righteousness coming into my life and, and into all of our lives. And it says, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. God wants to reveal to you the magnitude of his salvation in your life. There is a message that he wants to be uh, pro proclaiming and showing, demonstrating, not just in word, but in physical action to the world around you. Signs, wonders, and miracles are meant to be demonstrated in our lives. And, and not, just, not just supernaturally, like we pray for healing. Uh, I believe in healing with all my heart. Uh, we pray for, for um, you know, legs to grow, things like that. We, we do that. But there's signs, wonders, and miracles in your business. There's signs, wonders, and miracles in your education, just your life. It's not just a, uh, uh, um, a one-sided uh, one, one, one um, issue here. You are body, soul, and spirit, and God wants to reveal everything. So uh, I, I made reference to King Solomon, and uh, uh, it took him 40 years to, to accumulate the wealth that he accumulated. In three days... His son Rehoboam squandered the pretty well, well, 10 of 12 tribes. 40 years to build something up, three days to destroy it. But the, um, for the gods, all the gods of the peoples are idols. Idolatry, sin will bring poverty like that into people's lives. It, it destroys people. It absolutely destroys God has designed us to live in his fullness, not in the stupidity of the idols that tear society apart. And that's why it's so important that we live in everything that we do according to what his word says, according to what he says. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. I made mention of, of his throne. In Psalm 89, verse 14, and Psalm 97, verse 1 to 3, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Um, the Hebrew word chesed and emuna, or amet, which is translated usually in English as faithfulness and mercy or, or uh, loving kindness, go before him. You are made in the image of God. The chesed of God, you know, a, a, good Hebrew, a good definition or explanation of the chesed is the the, uh, the bowing of one's neck to an equal to lift that person up, to lift that equal up so that they are helped. That's what Jesus did for us. He was in the image of God. He is God. He is the Word made flesh. He emptied himself 
And he came to the cross, and it's like God bowed his neck to lift up you and I because he doesn't see us as less than. He sees us as made in his image. And when he lifted us up according to his grace, according to his chesed, uh, it it was more than just loving kindness. It was more than than mercy. English does a terrible job of, of translating that word. It was him bringing a wholeness, a completion into our lives so that we are lacking nothing. Colossians says that we are in Christ, we are complete, lacking nothing. And that's a really big deal. That doesn't mean you don't have problems. That doesn't mean you don't have issues. But it does mean that when he says you are full, you really are. Or, or that you're, you're not lacking anything. Here's, here's what the problem is. We fail to see that the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. And so we come up to a, a, up to a problem, and, and it requires the seed to be fully grown, but it's not. And so we try to speak to something with, as, uh, th- as a declaration. I have all things in Christ. I have all authority in Christ. Jesus has all authority and power given to him. Therefore, I have everything. Well, that's true, but if I haven't grown up into that place, I'm not going to ex- exercise the same authority and power that Jesus did when he faced that because it takes time for a seed to grow. The first law of the kingdom of heaven, uh, of creation actually, is seed, sow, and harvest. And a lot of times what happens is people come into a crisis and immediately they're saying, oh God, I believe, I believe, help me, help me, help me. But the, the, the word of God has not been planted in their heart and it hasn't had time to grow. And because it hasn't had time to grow, real faith is not there yet. And so we come and we go, in the name of Jesus, boom, and it doesn't move. And we're like, well, God must have failed. Uh, No, God didn't fail at all. But we, we misunderstood or misinterpreted who we are, or or not who we are, uh, where our position or where we had grown to. You see? So what I could do as a 10-year-old physically, I could not uh, I, I, as a 10-year-old, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't lift uh, 200 pounds on a bench press. Uh, the 200 pounds would crush me. But the, 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 uh, the muscles were there. The, the bone structure was there. Everything was there for me to be able to do that kind of exercise. But I needed to grow over the next 30 years to be able to get to that point where I could actually do that kind of, 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 of weightlifting. It's the same thing in your spiritual walk. We are all growing together. And as we walk together, as we function together, we do this. So we are chesed and faithfulness, God's wholeness, go before him. And then there is justice and there is righteousness that are the foundation of his throne. These are before God's throne. And as all creation, as the heavens are a reflection of who God is and what he has made, I draw this connection here. You also are a reflection of him. You are made in the image and likeness of God. He has made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through faith. So, You're not just covered with righteousness. You've come in through the door of Jesus and you have become something called righteousness. Zedek. We walk on this path to Jesus. Jesus is the path. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And because we've come into him, now God the Father looks down on us, his his light his glory is shining on us. That's splendor. The act of the cross was an act of justice. God poured out his judgment at the cross. He made a judgment that said, sin kills, but I give life. He made a judgment that you, you and I are made in his image and, and absolutely worthy to be saved. 
The cross is not about the darkness of sin. The, the, so, much, so many times I've heard this whole, this, 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 this teaching, this Jesus came only because of sin. It was because of sin. It's because I'm so worthless. I'm so wretched. I'm so horrible. I'm so bad. And oh, the sin, the sin, the sin, the sin, the sin, the sin. Sin was not the motivation of the cross. Sin had to be dealt with at the cross, but it was not the motivation. The motivation was you are made in the image of Jesus. You are made in the image and character of God. You are made to, to demonstrate his splendor and his majesty. You are made to be filled with the power of his Holy Spirit. You are made to live in the fullness of who he designed you to be, not as some ant that's trying to crawl and scurry underneath in the dirt. He made you to be everything that he wanted you to be. He's got purposes for you. He's got plans for you that, that he wants completed and fulfilled in your life. And and, and so he says, I want you, because of who you are, I want you. And sin is in the way, but because of your value, I make a judgment that I will judge sin in its wickedness. I will judge evil. I will judge the devil. I will judge the principalities, powers, and mights that are against it. And I will deal with it at the cross, and I will pour out my wrath on Jesus so that there is an absolute blood sacrifice so that you, my people, my children, my beloved sons and daughters can be raised up in justice. So it's not just a matter of, well, I'm, I'm, I'm forgiven, yay, I can just do whatever I want. I be, we become something, and it's a just decision from the court, the throne of God, that he made at the cross. That's splendor, and that's majesty. According to his word in Psalm 96, you and I are to be standing before the Lord at his throne, in splendor and majesty. The heavens are declaring the righteousness of God. You know, it says in Romans chapter 8, all of creation is longing, groaning, and travailing for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why? Because we carry his spirit. We carry his word. When, when we step into our right identity, when we step into our right position before him, then creation is blessed. When you're, when you're in, in right order and right position, people around you should be blessed. People around you should have security coming into their lives. There should be a peace that is flowing from you. It says, light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright. So if it is sown, there should be a harvest that is coming out of our lives of light and righteousness. So wherever I go, there comes this... Um, I'm going to call it revelation. Well, so, so uh, I, 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 <laughs> I'm going to use you, Tim. <laughs> uh, we were having coffee, just a short coffee, quite some time ago. And Tim was telling me about a, a business uh, transaction and how he, he was, uh, he's able to see things uh, uh, business-wise that other people can't see. And he's able to, to go, if you go down that path, you're going to suffer. You're going to go bankrupt. Whereas if you do this over here, that's smart, that's right. And you need to make some decisions that are going to prosper you. That's called being light in a place of darkness. Light is sown for the righteous. Joy for the upright. So I, I want to address... <laughs> I don't know, I just feel this, 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 it's burning in me. That there is so much more than we have initially considered in our lives that God wants to bless the world around you with. You're his ambassadors. And, and, I, and I feel like we've put this box that says Christianity fits in this little thing right here and it doesn't matter about anything else. We just come to church and that's it. No, that's not it. It, it, it is so much more. It affects your finances. It affects your, your politics. It affects your health. It affects your spirituality. It affects your soul. It affects your mind. It affects everything. Jesus didn't come and God didn't design you to have a little part of your life given to him. He said, I want to, you to be all mine, not just a part. 
It's, and, and, it, and it is such a privilege, it's such an honor, and it's such a responsibility that God, God Almighty, our Father who is in heaven, the, the one who designed it and created us, is saying, hey, you belong in my presence. If you can catch that in your soul, you belong in his presence. You belong to have his power flowing through you. It makes a massive difference how you pray. It makes a massive difference how you respond to things when you understand this, this is right. This is, this is the way I'm supposed to function. You know, when Jesus spoke to the weather, when he spoke to the waves, when he cast the demons out of the, the, the Gadarene uh, guy who was possessed, he wasn't going, oh God, would you please do this? In fact, he didn't pray. He spoke to it. Why? Because he knew who he was. I, I just feel that, that God is going, do you know who you are? When you stand before God, splendor and majesty is what he sees. Splendor and majesty. Kings don't ask for stuff. They command. You are made in his image. And then it says, um, uh, the, the, the the next two words in there are uh, beauty and strength. Holy Spirit demonstrated the strength when he raised Jesus from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. It says that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is towards you when he raised Jesus from the dead. In the, in the sanctuary, in the presence of God, Holy Spirit is there. And the beauty is, Jesus, uh, Revelation 22, verse 16, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, uh, says Jesus is the bright morning star. He's the, he's the beautiful one. Jesus is, the, is, is the, uh, the fragrance of heaven. He is, he is the beloved son. He is the one that we are becoming like. We are transformed from glory to glory. When you understand who you are and you come before God in his throne room, before his presence, growing in identity, wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, power, and the fear of the Lord, splendor and majesty. There is a growing of the Holy Spirit in beauty and a growing of the Holy Spirit in strength in your life. There you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When this happens, you will discover, if you pursue it, you will discover that there is a, 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 a growing authority that comes into your life. You will discover a growing sense of presence in your life. You will discover, because that's what God is all about. It's about you being like him and, because he made you in his image and his likeness. He has designed us for fellowship. Now, I'll close with this. Jesus taught us to pray this way. Our Father... So our is the first thing. So if, if, if 1 John chapter 4 says, if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, you don't know God and you don't love God. There is no such thing as father if we don't know love. And the love of God is demonstrated in our love for one another. I cannot according to the word of God, simply turn my back on, on my brothers and sisters and say, well, you don't matter and I don't care and you're wrong and I'm right and have this big old, you know what I'm saying? Because the scripture says, not me, if I don't have love for you, then I don't know him. It's a really sobering thought. There's a, whole lot, that's a whole more, there's a whole lot more to say about that. But the point is, our, we're not alone. The love of God is demonstrated between us. Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. From there, we understand, okay, you're my father. We're a family. Love is the, is the oil that keeps your lamp full. You know, remember the parable? There was 10 virgins. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Five wanted all the right stuff, but they didn't go and get the oil. 
And when the, when the bridegroom arrived, they didn't have time to go get it. Love for one another keeps the oil right up top. It's demonstrated in that. As, as I love God, I love you. Or let me put it this way. As I love you, I love God. I heard the Spirit of the Lord say to me just this week, will you worship me and proclaim my glory because of your love for one another? Oh, was, do I even know what the needs of my brothers and sisters are? In a lot of cases, I don't. It just was kind of like this. But here's the deal. Jesus came for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And he didn't say to his disciples, take a, take a discipleship course. He said, come and live with me because that is discipleship. I wonder what it would look like when we build each other up. I'm not talking about just this church. I'm talking about Edmonton. What would it look like when the body of Christ is prospering because of our love for one another? I think you would see a glory revealed in our worship and our praise. I think that you would see a a hunger within the community that says, I want what you have. I'm tired of being addicted. I'm tired of being homeless. I'm tired of, of all of the injustices that are taking place in my life. And again, I want to stress that the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. You don't say a word like this and then, oh, let's pray it. In Jesus' name, everybody love one another. <laughs> Everything's all better now. It takes time, lots of time, maybe generations, to see something like what I'm talking about manifest. It took generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It took generations. And one of the biggest problems that we have in the North American church is we have lost sight of the fact that it's our Father. And we're so concerned about my life and we've, we've lost sight of our grandchildren. We've lost sight of the future generations. But Abraham, he laid his life out. Everything that he did was for 400 years down the road. When he knew he wasn't going to be around. The same thing with Isaac. The same thing with Jacob. Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 said, Father, I pray for those who are yet to come. He did not, it wasn't just for 12 guys that he died on a cross. It was for you and me thousands of years later. When our love for one another has become such a present reality for us that we build each other up, body, soul, and spirit. I think the world is going to look at us and go, oh, I want that. And quite frankly, they're already saying they want that. Gangs. People are looking for a place to to belong. Twisted, for sure. And they're looking for a place to express their anger and their frustration and stuff. But, you know, I I remember talking to this one lady uh, who had gotten out of the hospital. She had been beaten something fierce and uh, alcohol was all at the, the source and the root of it. And I'd been walking with her for about two, three years. And uh, I, this was a, kind of a near-death situation for her. And I said to her, are you ready to walk away from this now? And she looked at me honestly and said, I don't think so. And I said, why? She says, because I'm too afraid of being alone. I'd rather be, she literally was saying she'd rather be beat within an inch of her life and abused than be alone. Why? Because there is something built within the very fabric of who we are to belong, to have love, to have intimacy with one another. When it's demonstrated the way God designed it to demonstrate, people just can't help but be attracted to you. And that doesn't all mean that they're going to bow down and go, oh, hallelujah, Jesus is Lord. doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean there'll be transformation in our community. It does mean that the standard of life will go up. It does mean that we will be a, a, a boat that is a, for people to come to. And, and yeah, maybe they won't agree with us. Maybe they'll be of a different religion, maybe, et cetera, et cetera. But Jesus died for all of them. He's, it's an open invitation. Whosoever will, come to me. And, and I'm, I am suggesting to you, according to what, I've, what the Lord has revealed to me in, in Psalm chapter 96, 
verse 4 and 6, that the splendor, the majesty, the beauty, and the power and strength that God is talking about in his throne room is going to be multiplied and increased and increased and increased in your life when this is a present reality in our life. Uh, let, let, me, let me say it this way. Our Father who is in heaven. So we have our, we have Father, and then next comes praise. Hallowed be your name. So by our love for one another, by our relationship with Father, then there comes worship. Then there comes the revelation of God's will. And then from the revelation of his will comes his kingdom being established around us in our soul, in our physical, and in our, in, in our spiritual. And then after that comes, give us this day our daily bread. There's provision, there's, there's, there's a fullness because fathers give protection, provision, and identity. And then after that comes this continual cleansing, this forgiveness, this washing from the word of God and the blood. Father, forgive us as we forgive others who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. There is a light that comes to our path. There's because we have counsel of one another around us. And just like my friend Tim is able to see things that I can't see, I'm naive. He sees things, and he's able to go, Gary, you idiot, don't do that. Um, because that's there, I've got counsel, and I need that. I can see things that you can't see, but you can see things that, like we need one another. And so there's this light that leads us as one, as a body of Christ, into, into a place of light where we're not going into temptation, and then comes the battle Deliver us from evil. The enemy will attack. Deliver us from evil is not, oh God, rescue me and keep me from all danger and trial. It is strengthen me with might. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel, the sword of the, of the word of God, the shield of faith. And we're going to go out and we are going to win because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so you, you see this progression that goes from, from our all the way to for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I'm saying that as we walk in the splendor and majesty of who we are, as we walk in the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and it just flowing in us, there is this increase, this, this rise of the river where we're no longer walking in the Holy Spirit. We're floating in the river of the Holy Spirit. We're no longer trying to go our own way and being pushed around and stuff. Now he's the current that directs us. And the scripture says in Psalm 46 that there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. You are those streams. You are that place of joy. You are that place of light. You, you, you are the only one that is designed by God to carry the light that that he really is. You're the only one who is designed to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Angels can't do it. Demons can't do it. That's why they hate you so much. And that's why they want to possess people because they're looking for blood because only blood can have that relationship. You're made in the image of God. Your, his splendor, his majesty, his, his beauty, his strength in his sanctuary is what he has designed you for. That's the place of prosperity. That's the place of abundance. That's the place where the fullness of the kingdom of heaven is being grown and multiplied in you. All of, all of creation is testifying to this. And I really believe that right now in this season, God is, as it were, putting a trumpet out saying, hey guys, my beloved sons and daughters, I'm calling you up. I'm calling you to a supernatural life that you didn't think was, that you didn't even conceive of. You couldn't imagine it. I'm calling you into a place that is filled with everything that I designed you for. You see, because you're made in the image of God and in his likeness, he has designed you to fulfill the purposes of God like David did. There are things that you naturally um, are built for. You're naturally designed for. And so you have desires for them. God's looking for those things to be fulfilled because they're part of the calling of God on your life. And when we love one another, we don't need to be jealous. Well, how come you got so much and I didn't get it? You know? Instead, it's, oh, I celebrate what God is doing in your life because we're one. We're one family in Christ. So, that's all I have to say about that. I, I, I pray that it blesses. I, I, 
I, I, I'm not looking to do an altar call because this is not a message that, well, let's just pray and boom, it's done. This is something that you have to take. You have to wrestle with this. This is something between your, one another, but with you and God as well, that, Lord, how, how are you going to work this out in my life? I'm yielded to you, but I'm not interested in having an experience. I'm interested in growing up in who you've made me to be over the long haul. Your children are waiting for you. Your grandchildren are counting on you. There are people, friends that you have, and people that are coming into your circle. They're counting on you. You have a unique voice, and only you can fill that because God made it for you. And you will find tremendous joy and fulfillment in that. Tremendous. I've never felt more at peace and more exhilarated than when I've been functioning in what God has designed me for. There's lots of other stuff that I can do, but it's not so fun. It's not so fulfilling. And, there th- and then there's things that I have to do because it's just a trial. <laughs> and there's no sidestepping trials. In fact, James says, count it all joy when you encounter trials because they result in the building up of your faith so that you're complete lacking nothing. First, Second Peter chapter 1 says the same thing. Romans chapter 5, 1 to 5 says the same thing. We count it a privilege. We count it joy. We, we praise God when we go through persecution and trials because it builds hope inside of us and, and hope reveals the love of God and we are not disappointed by the love of God. So I'm, I, I just, I'm, I'm throwing the challenge out there to you. Run with God. Run with him because you are made in his image. Seek God to, to, for, for revelation of, Lord, you say that I am made in your image. Reveal more of that to me. Teach me how to run with that. Teach me how to grow in that. Teach me how to do what you have called me to do because, well, the rewards are eternal. It's, it's amazing. And in doing that, you will, do, you will build up treasure in heaven. So let me just quickly close in prayer for this portion. I believe Pastor Sean is coming back. Yes, he is. So we're, gonna, we're just going to close here. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that your, um, that your will, your will as it is in heaven would be fulfilled in my brothers and sisters and me. Father, I ask for humility to clothe us, that we would walk carefully and tenderly before you. And I ask, Lord, that the seed of your word would be planted in the soil of our heart, coming to full maturity, that you would receive your harvest of faith and righteousness in our lives. Father, I bless my brothers and sisters today, and I I just pray, increase, increase your plans for them, God. Increase in fulfillment and growing them into the in, into the fullness of what you have purposed for each individual in Jesus' name. And Lord, what has just been of me, I ask that it would fall to the ground, let the chaff be blown away. But what is of you, God, your word, your harvest, the cross, Jesus, be magnified in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And bless you. Let's give Gary a hand for that. Thank you. Thanks.